Unfortunately, I can't see you, so I'll just have to shout out. Can you, can you repeat the question? If you guys are interested in white slot machines, yeah, repeat, or repeat the question. So, whoopsie. I think I, oops. I just, did you? I think, sorry, I just lost you. I just trying to get the. Uh, okay. All right. We're, uh, Jeff? Yeah. There we go. Yes. Okay, now we're back on. Now we can see you. Yeah, could you could you repeat <laughs> the question? Yeah, um, you could repeat so the question. question how, do any of you guys play slot machines or find slot machines interesting at all? No. They're, they're, it's okay. they're, I've played them and they're not really that interesting. <laughs> interesting or fun? Yeah, so when I when I started I didn't find slot machines interesting. It was just that I was out of college with a math degree and uh, IGT happened to be in the same town so I went to uh, university here. And, um, but the funny thing is they teach us a lot about why games are interesting in general. And that's what we're gonna talk about in the next part of our presentation. So let's see. Um, Heather, can you see the presentation now? Yes. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Yeah. All right, so our slot machine is really fun. And really, eh? and the, the funny thing about this is you might wonder, you know, why do people play these? Clearly, you know, the, the $40 billion that people spend on it is, is real money. So people are spending their time playing these. But are they really fun? And for me, as uh, I also, in addition to you know math, my background is in philosophy, so I like to ask these kind of questions. But well, then what is what is fun? And it really gets us to think about this topic in a very deep way. I, I imagine I've seen some of your guys' curriculum that you've probably talked about this a lot, maybe at nauseum. But hopefully, I can just throw another wrinkle onto the topic. And so to talk about fun. The first thing we have to do is we have to sort of dispel some myths about the brain. And um, one little caveat is that we are going to oversimplify a lot of stuff. Because when it comes to the neuroscience, when you look at the pop media right now, uh, there's a lot of over oversimplification about what's going on in the brain. It is incredibly complicated. Very little is actually understood. I, I think the best analogy I've heard is that today's understanding of the brain is about where Freud was when he understood psychology. So it was a great advance for the time, but there's still a long way to go to really put all this stuff together. But it is getting better, and it is helping us to either confirm things we sort of need natively, or to really just blow away our expectations and to create whole new models of how our brains actually work. And so one of those is the concept of pleasure versus reward, which is something we usually uh, think of as the same concept, that the two, uh, having some pleasurable experience in your brain is a rewarding experience and vice versa. Um, but in our quest here, the first thing we need to do is show that those are two different concepts. And we'll start with pleasure. And what I'm going to define as pleasure is pleasurable sensations. And this includes, you know, eating something sweet or salty, um, feeling warm and comfortable, touching something soft. These are all pleasurable sensations in that they actually are a feeling of pleasure. And they're processed in a particular part of your brain uh, that is dedicated to helping you feel that experience of pleasure. Now to contrast that, uh, some of you guys may be whiskey connoisseurs or like spicy food. And you might say to yourself, well, I like, you know, I would consider those pleasurable experiences. Some of you might not. Some of you may hate whiskey, some of you may hate spicy food, but some of you have learned to like these things and you would call them pleasurable experiences. But what I'm gonna what I would like to dispel is that really these are not pleasurable experiences and that they're experienced in the same way as those things I just previously talked about. And that that part of your brain that helps you experience pleasure doesn't ever fire in response to these things. Um, which may be puzzling because you learn to find these to be interesting, pleasurable experiences. And so what um, the literature talks about now is they call this, uh, this new experience reward. And what that is is that your brain has essentially learned to find interesting, novel, and surprising things uh, to be rewarding. And your brain incentivizes itself to seek out these experiences. Um, one way to kind of confirm this with spicy food is, well, you, you can think of probably tons of cultures that have traditionally a spicy food and you might think that people are predisposed to liking it. And that's actually really not true. Studies done with children across the world show that uh, children sort of revile spice, capsaicin, equally. Um, they're just exposed to it earlier and more often in some cultures, and so they learn to become accustomed to it and to like it. But everyone has that same non-pleasure response to it. It's just that that reward part of your brain learns to like it. Similarly, uh, anybody who learned to like whiskey or alcohol, um, 
Well, alcohol can be a bad example because wine sort of mixes the two because the sweetness in wine actually is pleasurable, but the alcohol taste isn't. Uh, but when you were, you know, probably a teenager and trying out, you know, like whiskey for the first time, you were drinking it for social reward, and then ultimately your brain associated the nice feelings of a buzz and getting drunk with alcohol, and it became a rewarding experience that you now think of as pleasurable. So, what is this reward system, and why is it so powerful? Because I would hypothesize, and actually, you know, a lot of studies confirm that this reward system is far more powerful than pleasure. Um, if you think about like dieting, it's, it's usually pretty easy to say put a chocolate cake on, um, whereas you know if you are addicted to say alcohol or you like spicy food, it's actually a lot harder to ignore uh, a reward signal than it is a pleasure signal, and that's because it, it's working on a different part of the brain that we're going to talk about. And so why we have a reward system kind of comes back to the fact that we're mammals. And in the uh, evolutionary tree, mammals sort of broke off in that they have higher level brain functions that were needed for processing rewards in the environment. So unlike compared to a, say, sea anemone or a sea slug or just lots of other animals in general, mammals have to go out and seek to find their food. Um, as opposed to just sitting there next to a rock and getting food when it comes by, or dying if you don't get any food. And if you think about this computationally, if any of you guys have studied artificial intelligence or machine learning, you understand that the seeking behavior is computationally very expensive. And so as a result, the mammal brain started developing more and more um, detailed structures on top of the old reptilian brain, which was on top of an even more primal brain. Uh, to enhance essentially the computational power of their brains. And this was so that they could do several functions. And namely that they needed powerful computation to do searching, so they were able to scan the environment and find things that they see to be rewarding. Then, once they have those rewards, they need to collate them into and order them. What is the most rewarding thing? What should I be investing my energy into right now? And then ultimately create a model of this to be able to predict future reward and create a stable environment for survival uh, in whatever environment they happen to find themselves in. And so uh, this sort of begs the question of how do we compare rewards? Like what is the actual cognitive machinery that compares rewards? And so for instance, you have to take, for example, you know, say food, you know, alcohol, sex, entertainment, you know, while these are all very different experiences, they activate lots of different parts of the brain. I mean, uh, but at, for the, the reward system, to really sort of help organize how the reward system operates, it needs a common comparator value. It needs some way to sort of say, I need beer right now versus food, or I need sex right now versus entertainment, or sex is entertainment, depending on what your uh, personal environment is. But how, did, how does the brain do this? And um, our brains are actually modeled very similar to an economy, which is why uh, the field that I do research in is called neuroeconomics. It's essentially using economic theory or the mathematics of economic theory to model certain subsystems of the brain. Not everything, just things like the reward system and a few other systems can be really well modeled with things like opportunity cost and supply demand curves. They act that, the, the, that mathematical language turns out to work really, really well for the reward system. And that's because the reward system uses a common comparator of value just like money, and that is uh, dopamine, as well as other neurotransmitters as well. But in the case of the reward system, dopamine is sort of the prime currency for reward. And I'll, I'll explain a little bit about how that works. So for instance, if you're playing a video game, or let's just say this is your natural environment, you are some creature in your environment, uh, what you have to know how to do is how to interpret this image. So you have senses hitting your brain, you have sense data that's being processed, but it has to be parsed. So those raw pixels of data have to be turned into uh, chunks, which include, you know, the uh, uh, barrio in this scene, the, in, you know, the floor, the bot or the enemy that's coming at you, the free guy that you're trying to get. All of these things need to be parsed into sort of their uh, higher level um, symbolic equivalents. And so our brain uh, has a first layer of processing that helps us to do that. And then given those certain symbols, the reward system next step of processing is to sort of identify what's the most important thing for me to focus on right now. So where should I be directing my resources so that I can uh, be most fit for survival? And so in this case, let's say the giant boss that's coming at me, I need to get rid of him or else I die and that is bad. So it's gonna direct your resources to that. And the way it does that is that the reward system is actually embedded at a very deep level of your brain. It's a very, in a sense, stupid gadget. It is um, 
very, it, it's not a high level uh, cognitive process that you're consciously aware of. It's actually, oops, sorry, I hit the wrong button there. Um, it is actually hardwired to say the motor cortex as well as other parts of your brain so that you're consciously pushing these buttons before your awareness is actually caught up to that fact. And that's mainly because your brain learned uh, long ago that it was more evolutionarily efficient to be an integrated circuit and to start sending signals off at the same time than to wait for them to be serially processed. And so that's, you know, like um, current neuroscience is really showing our brains are a giant parallel computer because it's very efficient to compute things in parallel than to wait for them serially because you get all the benefits of time. So, um, Moving on, the, the, the key uh, or the cornerstone of this is what's called error prediction. And Heather, how am I doing on time? I realize it's See, it's getting... okay, we're about, so does any, can everyone stay like another 10 minutes? Can anyone not stay? Okay, we have two people who can't stay. Can you, how long can you guys have to go right now? Yeah. Okay, we have two people who are going to leave and the rest that, that can stay. So, um, okay, so, so th thank you, you guys. And we'll have about 10 more minutes. Is that good, everybody? Yep. Okay, yep. good, great. Fantastic. Thank you for stealing some extra time for me. That was yeah, and different. sorry we ran a little bit late. We had a big exercise uh, going on. So, yeah. I'm the one that's uh, <laughs> no, running no, late. So, no, no. Um, uh, to speed up, so error prediction is uh, really a cornerstone of like AI processing. Um, so, I mean, if you guys get into the AI, AI world, uh, you'll start learning a lot about temporal difference learning or cue learning. There's lots of different learning algorithms that are out there. But mainly, it relies on, uh, you make a prediction about the world, and you need to see what happens, and then based on the difference, the delta between what happened and what you predicted, you feed that back into your model to make better predictions. And there's three interesting outcomes from this. The first one, uh, as Kyle has shown here, is when things are better than expected. So that delta is positive. Namely that you predict things would be okay or bad, and they turn out to be pretty good. And so you got the surprising surge. And what happens in your brain, essentially, is that uh, your dopamine levels spike in response to this. And that spike uh, helps incentivize you to seek out whatever it was you were attending to uh, when that positive signal came in. Then, of course, you have negative when things are worse than expected. And this is when your brain cuts off dopamine and the rest of your brain starts going through withdrawal, saying, I want my dopamine back. And so I need to switch targets or I need to avoid whatever I was doing when that bad signal came in. Um, but in learning, one of, the, or one of the things that actually is more interesting is the case when things are as expected. And what is kind of surprising in the neuroscience on this is when things are get what is expected, our brain does nothing. Because the reward system. We lost you. I think oh. we lost you. Mm, check your internet connection. The internet might have dropped the wireless is finicky at times. Yeah. I have to like turn on my wireless every time I turn on like a manual.